welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous video, we talked about the anatomy of the testes, but we really didn't get much past that. So we discussed the testes, the membranes that surround them, muscles that interact with them, and then also the seminiferous tubules, the epididymis, and then the beginning of the ductus deferens or vas deferens. We're going to continue with some more relevant anatomy here, um, but one of the major things I want to focus on, at least on this slide in this video, are the glands of the male reproductive tract. So we're going to begin by looking at a lateral view of this, and then we're going to take a look at an anterior view and see some other things uh, that we couldn't see in this image. All right, so let's discuss some relevant anatomy here. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So of course, this is where we left off in the previous video. Here's our scrotum. The scrotum is the sac that contains the testes. So here's one testis right here. Of course, here's the epididymis associated with that testis. And then we can see here that it loops around and we have the ductus deferens. So, so here, uh, at least it's labeled right here, here is our ductus deferens. And it pretty much just continues all the way up here, right? Now, understand that when we talk about the male reproductive system, we can't help but at least mention some things from the urinary system. And especially in males, these two systems are closely tied together. So right here, this organ is part of the urinary system. This is the urinary bladder. Um, it is just shown here, the urinary bladder plays absolutely no role in the reproductive system, at least directly. Okay, so here's the urinary bladder. Notice that the ductus deferens, or vas deferens, kind of loops up here and goes around the top, sort of the superior or lateral part of the, of the bladder, and then it kind of loops around here, and then we have this engorged part of the ductus deferens. Okay, this engorged part over here is referred to as the ampulla of the ductus deferens. So as you're looping around here, we get the ampulla. Right? Now, on each side of the urinary bladder, there's another structure right here. This is our first gland. This is actually what's called the seminal vesicle. So again, there's a left and right on each of these, just like there is for the ductus deferens. So this is our seminal vesicle. Now, we're going to go over the secretions of the seminal vesicles in a little bit, but it suffices to say that the sperm that are moving through the ductus deferens, when they enter this duct right here, they're going to combine with the secretions of the seminal vesicle. So notice the seminal vesicle, if you go down on it, we see there's a duct right here where it converges with the duct work of the ductus deferens. Okay? And where these converge, we call this the ejaculatory duct. Okay? So the ejaculatory duct is kind of like the convergence point between the ductus deferens ampulla and the seminal vesicle. And so the secretions from both of these are going to combine here. Now notice the ejaculatory duct is going to move through this kind of reddish structure. This reddish structure is called the prostate gland. It's important to realize that like a lot of these structures, um, only men have a prostate gland. Okay? Of course women don't have a seminal vesicle, and of course they don't have a ductus deferens, but the reason I emphasize that on the prostate is because when you're actually differentiating between a male and a female urethra, the prostate gland is actually a very important landmark. So only men have a prostate gland. And this is the second gland that we're going to look at. We'll come back and look at its secretions in a, in a few minutes. But it suffices to say this is the prostate gland and the ejaculatory duct is going to move through that. Okay. Now, Remember, this is our urinary bladder. And if you remember back to urinary physiology, remember that the way that the bladder is going to eliminate urine, it's going to move that urine into the urethra. Now, obviously, men have a much longer urethra. It's not because they're bigger people on average than women. It's because they have a penis. And of course, that urine is going to have to move through this urethra right here and eventually out the uh, urethral orifice right here into the toilet. So this structure right here, as we're going from the bladder, all of this, this is the urethra. Okay? It's a very long structure, and in men, men only, it's divided into three regions. 
Okay, this region of the urethra that runs through the prostate is aptly named the prostatic urethra. That's the first segment of the urethra, okay? The prostatic urethra. Notice that the ejaculatory duct converges into the prostatic urethra. In other words, the final exit point... So in other words, in order to get semen, which of course is going to contain the sperm cells from the ductus deferens, in order to get that out through ejaculation, it's going to have to move into the urethra and exit through the urethra. Okay, so at least in men, there's a very strong connection between the reproductive system and the urinary system, particularly the urethra, all right? Now, we're of course looking at a lateral view. Um, this part of the urethra right here, it's a very small part. It's basically beneath the prostate, but before it gets to the penis area. This is called the membranous urethra. It's a very small segment, the smallest of the three. The membranous urethra basically runs kind of through a series of muscles right here. There's some muscles in here, and collectively they are what are called the urogenital diaphragm. Okay, um, I'm going to have a separate video. Oops, let me zoom back out. A separate video where we discuss some of the muscles of the urogenital diaphragm. Um, basically, a lot of what their function is is to control continence. Um, so basically, to uh, basically voluntarily prevent yourself from defecating, or voluntarily pr uh, preventing yourself from urinating, or in some cases forcing urine or forcing semen out. Um, so they 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 perform a lot of functions like that but that's the urogenital diaphragm. And it suffices to say that right now, um, the membranous urethra runs through those muscles, okay? We'll talk about how that functions in a separate video. Now, if we continue into the penis area, the rest of this urethra is called the spongy urethra or sometimes called the penile urethra. I actually prefer the term spongy um, because it reminds me that, we'll see this on the next slide, that there's actually some spongy regions in the penis. There's actually one called corpus spongiosum and then corpus cavernosum. Um, actually reminds me of these two things. Now, there's actually one more gland. This is the third one. It sits right beneath the prostate and right um, kind of posterior to where the membranous urethra uh, merges into the penile urethra or spongy urethra. This gland is what's called the bulbourethral gland. Okay? Um, and you can see here that it has a duct that actually converges into the spongy urethra. Okay? Um, we're going to talk about its secretions in just a couple minutes. But what you can see here is that the spongy urethra travels through the penis and then ultimately is going to exit down here at this opening called the external urethral orifice. Okay, So really at this point, we can sort of track the movement of sperm, the full movement of sperm. So let's actually zoom back out here and go back to this slide right here. So this was in the previous video, but we're now going to track the complete movement of sperm and also semen out through ejaculation. So first of all, we begin in the testes. The sperm cells are going to be created and they're going to mature mostly in the seminiferous tubules here, which are going to be located in each of the testes. Okay. Then from there, they move into the reet testes, and then ultimately into these tubules, which are in the epididymis. So they're going to move down here, loop around here, and mostly be stored in this tail region of the epididymis. Then upon ejaculation, they're going to be moved up very quickly, actually, um, through this ductus deferens, or vas deferens, which then moves up the spermatic cord. Now, if we go back to this slide right here, here's our ductus deferens. It's going to be contained in the spermatic cord, but it's going to move up here. Let me actually zoom in a little bit more again. And it's going to loop around here, kind of over the superior lateral surface of the urinary bladder, and it's going to move into the ampulla of the ductus deferens. Okay. And then from the ampulla, it's going to move through the ejaculatory duct into the prostatic urethra. Now, as this moves through the ejaculatory duct and merging with the prostatic urethra, um, the prostate is going to add some more secretions. And pretty much once it does, we can call the final secretion semen. Okay. So remember, semen is not the cells. Semen is a, is a solution that contains a lot of other things and also contains those sperm cells. But at this point, we can call it semen. Then it moves through the membranous urethra and then into the spongy urethra and then eventually out the external 
urethral orifice. Okay? So that's the flow of semen and sperm out during ejaculation, and that's something very important to know. Now, before we go any further onto the next slide and discuss more anatomy, I want to discuss these three glands right here because they're actually extremely important. The first one that we encountered was the seminal vesicles. Okay? So what do the seminal vesicles do? Well, they produce an alkaline solution that helps neutralize vaginal acidity, which prolongs the lifespan of the sperm. So the whole goal of the male reproductive tract is to pass on genetic information uh, by fertilizing the female's egg, right? But the inside of the female reproductive tract, that is the vagina um, and, the, uh, and the uterus, is extremely acidic. Okay. So in order to help the sperm cells out, the sperm cells are combined into the secretion from the seminal vesicles, which is alkaline. And so when that solution ends up getting inside the vagina, it helps neutralize the vagina's acidity. Okay. There's also another protein here produced called seminoglean, which basically causes the semen to become sticky and jelly-like after ejaculation. This also helps them adhere to the walls of the vagina, prevents them from falling out as much. But there's also other things, of course, proteins, enzymes, mucus, ascorbic acid, flavins, and prostaglandins and fructose. And the prostaglandins and fructose, I want to mention um, because they actually have some important functions here. Um, the prostaglandins are extremely important because what they do is they actually complete the final maturation step in the sperm cell. Remember that when the sperm cells are in the epididymis, they're pretty much completely mature except for one major thing. They can't swim yet. Okay. Sperm cells have to be able to swim up the vagina, uh, through the cervix, up the uterus, and so on and so forth. Okay. But without prostaglandins, they can't swim. So what the prostaglandins do is they give the sperm cells that one final ability to be able to beat around their flagella so that way they can swim up the female reproductive tract and potentially fertilize an egg. Okay, so that's from the seminal vesicles. Now I also mentioned the prostate gland adds some stuff in there as well. Um, the prostate gland does secrete a slightly acidic solution, but it's not enough to overwhelm the alkalinity of the seminal vesicle solution. Okay, so it's still going to be an overall alkaline solution. But the prostate gland also secretes a number of other things, including, including proteolytic enzymes, prostatic acid phosphatase, fibrinolysin, zinc. There's actually a lot of zinc in semen and then something called prostate-specific antigen. So the prostate-specific antigen is also important because what it does is it further augments the ability of the sperm cells to swim, but it's also useful medically because if prostate-specific antigen or PSA becomes elevated, it can indicate that the individual may have prostate cancer. Um, remember that this is a male-only uh, substance, and so you're not actually going to see this in females. Females cannot get prostate cancer because they don't have a prostate. Uh, remember that. Also, the proteolytic enzymes are also important because when the sperm cells eventually end up in the female reproductive tract, assuming that occurs, uh, there's all sorts of uh, different proteins that might actually uh, try to attack the sperm cells. In fact, the woman's reproductive tract will actually view the sperm cells as foreign cells and try to destroy them. It's a very hostile environment. The proteolytic enzymes can help degrade some of those proteins that might actually attack the sperm cells because they technically are foreign substances. Okay? Now, the last of these glands is not really as important in the actual act of ejaculation. This is the bulbourethral glands. Okay. So what is the function of the bulbourethral glands? Well, let's assume a guy knows he's going to have sex. All right. So it would be assumed that if you're going to have sex, you would know you're going to have it before you do it. And so what will happen is um, during erection, the bulbourethral glands will secrete a secretion prior to ejaculation. And it kind of goes into the spongy urethra. And what it does is it actually neutralizes the acidity that's in the urethra. Okay? So naturally, the inside of your urethra is acidic. The major reason for that is because that's how you urinate. And so when you urinate, there's always going to be residual urine left in the urethra. You can't really get all of it out. Okay? Urine is acidic, and so this secretion by these bulbourethral glands neutralize that. So that way, whenever ejaculation occurs, uh, it maximizes the amount of viable sperm cells that exit. Because remember, sperm cells do not like acidity, 
and it turns out that urine is very acidic. The reason I mentioned fructose here is fructose, similar to glucose, but not, fructose is actually the major fuel source for sperm cells. Um, it turns out that the reason there is fructose in the semen is so the sperm cells can actually have an energy source uh, for the brief time that they're actually in the female reproductive tract. Because if there was no external fuel source that they could intake, uh, they would die because they'd run out of ATP. So they have to be able to generate energy somehow. So uh, the male reproductive system is nice, gives them a little energy in the form of fructose. I think I'm going to conclude this video right here, and in the following video, we're going to discuss a little bit more anatomy. Um, we're going to look at an anterior view of the male reproductive system, and we're going to see a few other structures here. Once we conclude that, we're going to have two other videos where we discuss the urogenital diaphragm, and then also the process of spermatogenesis, so make sure to join us then. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.